Hi folks, Dr. Hale here. Welcome to the second video lecture for Methods of Film Analysis. This video will provide a quick overview of the emergence, development, and ultimately, as is the focus of this course, the cultural impact of film on daily life and the popular imagination. The history of film is, as pretty much the history of anything has to be, partial and incomplete. We're going to cover a lot of ground in this video, and obviously there are many things that I'm going to be leaving out. But keeping all of that in mind, let's get started. Film technology is the result of countless failed inventions and experiments and happy accidents by the likes of scientists and artists who operated at the intersection of science, technology, and creativity. They wanted to capture a moment of time, freeze it in place, and objectify it, thereby transforming a strip of life into something solid. There wasn't some sort of grand overarching plan to combine audio and film technology with live performance and music in it just sort of grew into that over the last 125 years or so. The story of film begins with the camera obscura. The camera obscura, which you can see here, Latin meaning dark chamber, sometimes is referred to as a pinhole camera. And the technology is old, with references to this principle of pinhole technology going as far back as 500 BCE in the works of ancient Chinese philosophers and also appearing about a half century later in the writings of Greek philosopher Aristotle. You've probably even used a pinhole camera at some point in your life to take a look at a solar eclipse without burning off your corneas. The idea is pretty simple, and you can make one at home with nothing more than some trash bags, tape, and time. Essentially, the camera obscura is a box with a hole in it. The box could be as big as a room, as you can see in this video, or as small as a shoebox. There just needs to be an aperture, a hole, through which light passes and then a reverse image appears on the opposite side of your box. This is Ibn al-Hasim, an 11th century Arab astronomer, mathematician, physicist, and father of the study of optics. His experimental studies with the camera obscura, though it really wasn't called that at the time, and his writings fundamentally changed how human beings understood how vision operated. Some theories at the time had suggested that human beings sort of project light outward from the pupils. His argument was that it operated the other way around, that light actually entered into the eye. His ideas and writings, and particularly his book of optics, captured the imagination of a number of thinkers from Italian polymath Leonardo da Vinci, who in the 15th century, as you well know, invented turtles, to Johannes Kepler, seen here with eating a Kit Kat with children's chopsticks. Um, his writings contains the earliest known use of the name Camera Obscura, and even French philosopher and all-around genius human being who makes you wonder if you've ever accomplished anything in your entire life, René Descartes. You may remember him from such phrases as cogito ergo sum, or if we translate that, I think, therefore, I am. Does this have anything to do with cameras? No, not really, but I wanted to animate text on the screen. Around the second half of the 16th century, the camera obscura was fitted with a lens that improved the clarity of the images that they were able to produce. These devices were used for scientific experiments and served as powerful tools for artists who wanted to produce more accurate drawings of the physical world. Let's jump forward now from the 16th century up to the 17th when inventors and tinkerers were experimenting with the use of photosensitive chemicals to capture images. In 1826, a French inventor by the name of Joseph Nicifor Nisby, often described as the father of photography, developed a technological process known as heliography, which was used to create what remains the oldest surviving camera photograph. The image named, View from the Window at Le Gras, required an extremely long exposure time to capture, with estimates ranging from around eight hours to several days. This, of course, made it extremely impractical as a tool for expression or memory or any number of countless applications that we might use photographs today. In 1839, Louis Daguerre, a French artist and inventor, developed a new photographic process that shortened this exposure time from a matter of several days down to a few minutes. The daguerreotype process involved exposing a highly polished piece of silver-plated copper to iodine vapors. The plate would then be placed into a wooden camera box with an aperture and lens where it would be exposed to light for a controlled amount of time. The plate would then be treated with mercury and the image fixed in a solution of salt water. The daguerreotype became the first commercially available and therefore widespread photographic technology throughout the 1840s and 50s, and because of this, it's often considered the sort of birth of photography. Similar photographic processes were developed in the coming years, among them the ambrotype, in which an image was developed on a plate of glass. This process emerged in the 1850s and was followed shortly thereafter by the tintype, which rose into prominence in the 1860s and 70s. 
In the tintype process, a positive image was produced on a thin, albeit a relatively durable, sheet of metal that was then coated in lacquer. All of these plate-based technologies, if you want to call them that, were superseded by the development of albumin photographic print that was developed in the 1850s. And that became the dominant photographic medium in the 1860s up until the 1890s. This process used albumin, that is, egg white protein and sodium nitrate, to bind photosensitive chemicals to a paper that could then be exposed to light in order to capture an image. At the tail end of the 19th century, an American entrepreneur named George Eastman, founder of the Eastman Kodak Company, introduced a number of innovations in film technology into the market that would pave the way for the modern motion picture and the proliferation of still photography in daily life. In 1884, Eastman developed the first functional and practical role of film. In 1889, Eastman Kodak introduced a crude celluloid commercial film stock, and just three years later, the company was the number one supplier of film worldwide. And this brings us to the early history of the motion picture. Around 1832, the Finikistoscope, a spinning disc with a series of images depicting the various stages of motion of a subject, became the earliest widespread animation device. It produced the illusion of a two-dimensional fluid motion on that spinning disc. The technology was invented at nearly the same time by two different inventors, Joseph Plateau in Belgium and Simon von Stoffler in Austria. In 1878, Edward Muybridge, an English-American photographer, used multiple cameras to depict animal locomotion. Leland Stanford, an American industrialist, railroad tycoon, and politician, hired Muybridge to photograph his horse, Occident, so as to settle a debate within the equestrian world. The matter that needed settled... Is there a moment when all four of a horse's feet are suspended in the air when the animal is at a trot? This pulled Muybridge from his earlier work of landscape photography towards his photographic studies of motion. In 1882, a French scientist by the name Etienne Jules Murray developed a new technology known as the chronophotography. This was essentially a camera gun that would produce 12 consecutive frames of a photographic subject in motion. Murray used this technology to document the locomotion of humans and a variety of animals. Two years after introducing the kinetoscope, Edison created the kinetophone, which connected his earlier invention, the cylinder phonograph, with the kinetoscope. This new technology allowed a single viewer to watch a moving image while simultaneously listening to audio through a pair of earpieces. These devices had a huge influence on public imagination, as they were on display at public events and conventions around the world. But again, this kind of viewing practice was a purely individualistic experience between one viewer and one strip of film. But all of that would change at the first public screenings of film at the Grand Café in Paris, France in 1895. Auguste and Louis Lumiere, much like Jacob or Wilhelm Grimm or Mario and Luigi, are often simply referred to as the Lumiere brothers. Born in Bessesson, France, the sons of Charles Anthony Lumiere, a businessman who operated a small factory that produced photographic plates. The Lumiere brothers developed a number of innovations in motion picture technology. After their father had seen one of Edison's kinetoscopes at an exhibition in Paris and described the device to his two sons, the brothers set out to invent new technologies that would overcome the limitations of that device, chiefly its size and the fact that it was a single viewer experience. In 1895, the brothers created what they called the cinematograph, a device that was a combination of a motion picture camera, printer, and a projector. They used this device to create a number of short films. The first was entitled Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory, a 46-second film, which you can see at the top right, was shown at the first commercial public screening of films, uh, along with 10 other films on December 28, 1895. In total, all of these 10 films clocked in at a kind of runtime of about seven and a half minutes. These early films by the Lumieres contained no edits, no sound, and told no specific narrative. They were documentary in nature, committing the lived experience of daily life onto film where they could be viewed by a public and suddenly... Film viewing was a social rather than an individualized, isolated experience. Just two years before the Lumieres would launch the first public screening of films in France, Thomas Edison would complete the first dedicated production studio, what's often referred to as, as, as America's first uh, film studio or movie studio, in West Orange, New Jersey. In the early 20th century, French illusionist and director Georges Millier was one of the pioneers of early motion pictures, developing the use of special effects, multiple exposures, storyboards, cross dissolves, and other technical and narrative innovations to tell stories through the emerging medium of the motion picture. In June of 1905, the very first theater dedicated to showing motion pictures, the Nickelodeon, opened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The name Nickelodeon, which you've probably heard from the television uh, network for children, 
is a portmanteau of the price one would pay for watching a film, a nickel, and the ancient Greek odeon, meaning a building constructed for the purpose of music, theater, or other forms of public performance. Around 1900, George Albert Smith was one of the first, if not the first, filmmaker to use the close-up, rather than framing his subjects in long shots, as the Lumieres or Millier and others had done, which in a way treated filmmaking as something more akin to stage. In 1902, George Millier's Jules Verne-inspired film, A Trip to the Moon, was the first science fiction film. Its long runtime of 18 minutes, special effects, an incredible costume and set production, and emphasis on storytelling was incredibly influential to the medium. Edwin S. Porter's 1903 film, The Great Train Robbery, introduced editing as a central narrative device and thus introduced audiences to the language of editing as a means of depicting time, space, and change through film. The Great Train Robbery was also the first film remake, as it was recreated by director Sigmund Lubin in 1904, just one year after the film's initial release. 1906's Humorous Phases of Funny Faces, directed by James Stuart Blackton, was the first animated motion picture. In 1915, D.W. Griffiths released The Birth of a Nation, a racist propaganda film that celebrates the Ku Klux Klan as heroes and represents lynching as a brave patriotic act. This was the first big-budget Hollywood film, and it was also, incidentally, the first motion picture screened at the White House for then-President Woodrow Wilson. In 1916, Griffith followed his debut film with its sequel, the first film sequel, in fact, entitled The Fall of a Nation, which was also super racist. Robert Vina's 1920 film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is recognized as the first horror film. Charlie Chaplin produced and starred in a number of silent films as his on-screen persona, The Tramp, in the 1920s and 1930s, becoming an early film star and beginning a career that would span 75 years. The Jazz Singer, released in 1927, was the first feature-length motion picture with synchronous sound and a score, what would be called at the time, The Talkies. It was also, accordingly, the first musical film. From the 1920s into the 1960s, film production and distribution was dominated by five major studios operating in Hollywood, California. This included Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, better known as MGM, RKO Radio Pictures, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, and Paramount Pictures. Under this system, film studios were vertically integrated. They would produce a film on their studio lot with a creative workforce from directors, cinematographers, set designers, and actors who were locked into long-term contracts and then exercise control over the distribution of those films, either by showing them at their own venues or through a practice known as block booking. Studios would bundle together a number of films and force independent theater owners to purchase the rights to show those films sight unseen. Block booking enabled studios to bundle subpar cheap films with a few A-list features to ensure maximum profits at the expense of independent theater operators. The practice was extremely common in the 1930s until it was outlawed by the United States Supreme Court antitrust decision in U.S. v. Paramount Pictures, Inc. in 1948. Growing public concern amongst some Americans about the powerful moral influence that films could exercise over audiences and fearing potential censorship from religious leaders Hollywood hired former Postmaster General Will Hayes to act as the chairman of the self-regulatory board known as the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. The Motion Picture Production Code of 1930, what is unofficially but more commonly referred to as the Hayes Code, established a rigid set of moral guidelines for the film industry to self-regulate its content production. Generally speaking, the code wasn't strictly enforced until about 1934, when public outrage sparked by a series of quote-unquote immoral films, um, and then the code started to be more enforced. The Hayes Code restricted a number of things. Films couldn't positively depict crime or immorality, nudity, sexual behavior, religion couldn't be mocked, interracial relationships couldn't be depicted, the quote-unquote sanctity of marriage had to be upheld, and so on and so forth. In 1968, the Hayes Code was officially replaced by the Motion Picture Association of America's film rating system, and that's still in use today. The rating system informs audiences of the content of a film, and then each individual viewer, with that information in mind, can make a decision about whether she or he wants to watch a given movie. All right, so in interest of time, we're going to kind of gloss over a lot of history and technological developments and a number of amazing films. But I do want to provide you before leaving here with a quick and overly simple decade by decade orientation or framework. The 1920s silent era gave way to the development of the studio system. And in 1927, the talkies. 
This was followed in the 1940s by the golden age of Hollywood cinema, though that is, I want to remind you, an oversimplification of this simple, linear, sequential story that I'm trying to tell here. Well, that continues into the 1950s with the birth of the epic historical biblical fantasy film spectacles like Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments, and Spartacus. And then we have the decline of the studio system that gives rise to independent films and the American New Wave. And it's here where I'm going to change presentational tactics a bit to talk about the films of the 1960s into the early 21st century. The New Hollywood, post-classical Hollywood, or American New Wave movement was sparked by a new generation of young filmmakers. In contrast to the earlier studio system, the film director was the key creative and authorial voice that shaped the tone, feel, and message behind films produced during this period. We see directors like Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, uh, Stanley Kubrick, Francis Ford Coppola, among others, develop films that push against the conventions of the classical Hollywood era. In the 1970s, we see the emergence of the Hollywood blockbuster with Jaws in 1975 and continued refinements in special and visual effects. In the 1980s, audiences are treated to teen movies, a growing number of film sequels, and the emergence of the testosterone-addled, oh my god, I can't possibly wear a t-shirt while shooting uh, at Things action star. In the 1990s, just as we see the rise of independent filmmaking, we have the emergence and early adoption of computer-generated imagery, though it did develop in the 1970s originally, but it really takes off in this time period. Um, these sort of CGI technologies are used to tell more complex, bigger, and more visually stunning stories than ever before. The trend continues and intensifies into the 21st century, where we see the growth of the mega franchise, or a new style of long-form storytelling, where films operate much more like a mini-series or television program with a deep narrative continuity. Characters appear across a number of films to tell huge epic stories that expand, in the case of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for instance, over 23 films released over a decade. And so, this is where we find ourselves today. At the time of filming this, the film industry is essentially at a halt in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, with very little new content being released to audiences and consumers and or being produced. Okay, so that was a lot of content, a lot of history, and I left out a ton of stuff. But we covered a few hundred years of technology and innovation and happy mistakes and creative achievements in the history of film. So thank you for watching and take care.